Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our first of four talks about centrality. We'll be looking at the center of human experience, which is to say we'll be looking at the human self. This idea that I am a person or a me that meets the world. And wherever I go, I take that sense of being a me with me. So no matter where we go, we have the sense of being at the center of a world of experience. And it's this quality that we'll be looking at in this series. I think there's an advantage to this in helping us meet our lives with greater equanimity, ease, and feelings of empowerment. So there is this person, this me, that we take with us everywhere. What I'll be presenting is a way of looking at the self, or the me, a way of framing it. I think it has validity. I'm drawing on fairly well-established biology. But some of it is my own opinion. And I'm not trying to present this as the most accurate way of looking at the human self, simply as a useful one. The first point to make is that this me that we bring to the world is always exactly that, a me in the world. So it's a me in context. And we all of us, I believe, have a sense of somehow or another being a separate entity from the people, animals, plants, and landscape around us. But that sense of being a separate entity is not something we're born with. As far as scientists can tell, babies have an undifferentiated feeling of experience. They don't have this notion that they're a little baby and there are other people and other things around them. They simply experience life as a uniform wash of sensations and so on. But pretty quickly, they get the notion into their experience that they are, in fact, in some way separate from their mom and dad or whoever's raising them, and as they get older, from lots of other people and a great big world. And all of us have lived long enough by now, of course, to have that pretty well built into our consciousness. And being a single organism in a world of billions upon billions of organisms presents us with a challenge. How do we negotiate this complex situation we find ourselves in? How do we make sure that we stay alive, that we don't get harmed, that we enjoy ourselves, that we get our needs met, and so on? And so much of life, especially early on, is working out how to engage the world in effective ways. Now, it seems to me that a step that we take rather automatically that's very helpful in this process is to highlight this sense of separation between the me on the one hand and the world on the other. By making that separation, I can examine the world as if it's separate from me. You know, in, an, in a certain sense it is, but I can exaggerate that separateness and then the world becomes an object for my study. I can study reality and learn its rules. What do people expect of me? What sorts of behaviors win allies? What sorts of behaviors cause people to dislike me or become enemies, etc.? And we learn some of this from observation, watching our family and our peers, and we learn some by trial and error, and there are lots of other ways we figure it out. At the same time that I'm studying reality, I can study myself, try to get a sense of how I look to other people. And early in life, for sure, and sometimes throughout life, my sense of identity can revolve rather solidly along around things that seem characteristic of me as a person in a social environment. So I can look at my social connections and consider those part of who I am, and certainly my knowledge base and my belief system and the things I own and the stuff I like to do and what preferences I have about all sorts of stuff. That becomes a sense of who I am, and I can tweak and adjust this to look a little better to others, more appealing, uh, to win them over if possible. And this is a solid strategy that many of us employ our entire lives, and I think just about everybody employs when they're young. 
And it is an aspect of centrality, because certainly this idea we have about who we are in terms of all of these connections and possessions and so on, that is in some way centered around us as individuals. Now, as we get older, this strategy of relying on our possessions and our knowledge and all the impressive activities, our travels and so on, all the stuff that gets posted to social media, as we get older, that may begin to feel somewhat less effective as an approach and also somewhat less satisfying. And some people, in fact, I think many people, and I'm one of them, begin then to turn attention away from the stuff that other people might judge us by and begin to go deeper and to look at what's really at the heart of this human organism that I call me. As we proceed through this series of talks, we'll look at the interior of the organism, the me, from two rather obvious perspectives. And these are the objective and the subjective, or in more everyday language, the view from outside and the view from inside. So in a certain sense, the view from outside is the view of ourselves we get when we look in the mirror. And the view from inside is the experience we have directly in our consciousness. So directly in my consciousness right now, I have thoughts, I'm telling a kind of story. And really, even when I'm not recording a video, I'm always telling some kind of story to myself. And that story is that stream of consciousness, the images and words that play through my mind. And that's interior to me, no one else gets direct access to it. There's also a feeling tone. Much of it's centered around my heart region, but really spreading through the whole midline of the body from pelvic region up to the forehead, the sense of having feelings. And then there are sensations of simply being an organism in a three-dimensional environment, having arms and legs and walking and relating to gravity, etc. All of those are direct experiences that I have within myself and that no one else has in the way I do because everyone else is moving around in a different body. Now, every body has a brain. And so I know I have a brain. I've never seen my own brain, but I know it's in there and I can imagine it. When I imagine it, I'm imagining this thing, which in some sense, I'm not directly experiencing. It's an idea that I have or an image that I have. And in that sense, I'm imagining it from the outside. I could do the same thing with my vital organs, my lungs and heart and liver and intestines. I can imagine what's in there, but that's a very different experience from feeling the sensations around my heart area. And similarly, I can imagine the skeletal system that gives my body the shape that it has and helps it move through the field of gravity of this planet. I can imagine that skeleton, but again, that's an experience of imagining it as if it's separate from myself somehow. It's not quite the same thing as feeling right into my pelvic region, into my hip area, and noticing what I feel there. I like to look at these two perspectives with a metaphor, and that is the metaphor of a geode, a mineral that is hollow on the inside. From the outside, geodes look like rocks, and we're seeing one here, and we can pick it up and feel its texture. We might notice that it feels lighter than a rock ordinarily would. We could run chemical analysis by scraping a little off the surface. We could even CT scan this rock and see that it's hollow inside. But unless we can actually enter the interior of the geode, we won't really have that rich inner experience. So if I look at myself in the mirror, I see an image of a human body and a human person. But there's a sense in which a lot is missing when I look at the mirror as opposed to when I feel in my interior, that rich, vibrating, textured, flowing sense of aliveness. Let's focus a bit on this outside view. Everybody has a body. They differ, of course, in how they look according to biological sex, weight, age, ethnicity, life experience. 
but everybody has a body that is recognizable as a human organism. And everybody has a body that has an interior, and we can study that interior with various technologies like this MR scanner. And we can see what's inside the body with that technique. When we look inside the body with this kind of instrument, we're looking as if from the outside, exactly with the perspective of the technician or radiologist who's sitting here in front of the monitor. That person is seeing the inside of the body, but it's a view from the outside. If that's clear, I hope it is. It's a very powerful way of looking at the body and it gives us all this detailed information. Now in this series, we're gonna be focusing primarily on the nervous system because it has so much to do with our sense of self, our sense of being a me in the world. In the simplest terms, the nervous system consists of a brain and spinal cord and peripheral nerves, such as we see here. But the complexity is really astounding in terms of what we know about the nervous system. Of course, we know a lot about the brain now. We're looking at a large scale image of the brain. This view was available to humans for as long as people have been around, uh, certainly after injuries and so on. There would be times that brain tissue could be glimpsed or even uh, dissected. But only in relatively recent terms have we had a perspective that goes very deep into brain tissue. So deep that we can look at individual brain cells and see how they're branching and how they communicate with one another. And we'll look at some of this, both in this talk and in the talks to follow, because this is somehow related to our sense of being a person. It helps us construct a feeling of being a human in the world. So in this series of talks, we're going to really be considering this idea of having a nervous system that gives us information, particularly about the body. Of course, there's also information that tells us about the outside world, and actually we'll discuss that in the next series of talks. But this time we're going to look at the information that comes to us from the inside. What does the nervous system tell us about the center of our being? Well, we can look at that center of the being from a completely different perspective. We don't need MR scanners and all sorts of fancy technology. We can just feel inside to get information about the inner being. And when we feel inside, we're at least partially feeling our own nervous system, but we're using a very different method and a very different perspective. This can be quite powerful. We can become very careful observers of that inner experience. And over the centuries, people have become very careful observers. What we find when we feel directly inside is a rich, vibrating, often rather warm and flowing field of changing experiences. In the East, for instance, in the yoga and Hindu traditions, this study has been developed to a high degree. The notion that there are different energetic regions in the human body called chakras comes from that tradition. When I took a yoga teacher training and subsequently taught at a yoga institute years ago, we were often looking for ways to line the chakras up with Western anatomy. And that can be done a little, but it's never a very accurate mapping. I think the best way to look at chakras is that they're the result of very careful observation of inner experience using this inside view. And even relatively unsophisticated observers like myself can notice that there is a qualitative difference between how consciousness feels in my head region versus how it feels in my lower belly or pelvic region. And I think that is the beginning point of understanding chakras. I also studied and practiced acupuncture for a time, and I think a similar case can be made here, that the energetic channels described by the acupuncture system are most easily understood as subjective experiences that are felt either by the individual patient or by the acupuncture practitioner. They do line up roughly with some anatomical structures, but it's, a, it's not a very tight mapping and I think the detail of the system comes more from careful subjective observations. So this inside view is quite powerful. 
In this talk, I'm going to introduce briefly something we'll come back to, and that's the notion that we can group the energetic experiences in the body into three zones, roughly speaking, the head, the heart, and the lower belly. And we'll come back to that in later talks. For now, the point I want to make is that we have these two ways of examining the body from the outside and from the inside. And they each give us information. That information is clearly talking about a single organism, so there have to be relationships, but they feel differently, at least on first glance, they seem almost opposed to each other. Because after all, the inside experience is one of a flowing, tingling, vibrating, warm, alive sensation that runs from head to toe and is with us every moment. The outside perspective has this kind of analytical, uh, rather fixed in time picture, like an anatomy textbook. It's quite detailed, it's quite fascinating, but it's not directly felt and it seems a little bit detached and maybe not even as alive in the same way. It doesn't feel alive. It's obviously about life, but it doesn't have that feeling of aliveness, or at least it doesn't seem to. And that's something I'm going to work with as we go forward. Because ultimately the two must map onto one another. There is clearly a relationship between what we see when we look from the outside and what we see when we look from the inside. And one place where these two clearly come together is in the brain. So we know what a brain looks like from the outside. We see it here. But there are regions in the brain, one of which is highlighted in salmon in this cutaway view, that are clearly very tightly associated with internal direct experience of bodily sensations, particularly in the body core. The salmon colored region we see here is called the insula, and it's been shown to have a lot to do with the sensations we have of inner experience in our body core. And of course, that also relates to what we call emotions. So this can be a meditation, this correspondence between the outside view that gives us a picture of a brain and spinal cord and peripheral nerves and nerve cells and the inside view that has that sparkling, flowing quality of aliveness. We can sit in meditation and feel into the brain case, the skull, and know, visualize the brain that lives there we can feel along the length of the spine. And out into the arms and legs and across the front of the body. And the back of the body and the face and the soles of the feet. Feel all of that and know that that sensation is related to nerve cells that spread through the whole body that process information in the central system. So we have this picture, these ideas, these facts, but we also have the direct experience of a living body from head to chest region to lower belly and throughout. So I invite you to practice the meditation I briefly sketched on your own. But we'll move on and return to this organ that we call a human brain. Here we're seeing a simulation of brain activity. So the brain has within it some 85 billion nerve cells and these are all active electrically. They get activated in brief pulses. Now some brain cells only activate every few seconds and others may activate dozens of times a second. The rate of activation or firing depends on what the brain is doing and different regions will be more active in some activities and less active in others. And so there's a constantly changing pattern 
of sparkling activity in all of these brain cells. This simulation gives us a crude idea of what's going on inside the brain. How crude it is can be emphasized by considering that only about one one millionth of the actual brain activity is represented here. So you could take this diffuse sparkling that we're watching and multiply it times a million and get a somewhat more accurate picture of true brain activity. But even then, it would be a limited view because we wouldn't be taking into account how all these cells interact with each other, how different signals flow and respond and are modified and so on. But it's a start to give us an appreciation for what's going on in our bodies, in our consciousness. If we zoom into the level of individual brain cells, we can see that they have these branches, these little threads coming off of them, technically called dendrites and axons. And there I'm highlighting some, and we're going to zoom in, and this is an actual region of a nerve cell shown in an experimental preparation where the cell has been modified so that it emits visible light every time it has electrical activation inside of it. And so you can see this flickering behavior of an individual cell. And again, the actual pace of flickering will vary depending on the cell's activity and the body's activity. But you can see that this is a living system and that it has this dynamic quality to it. Now we can zoom in further on just a little subset of all of these twigs and here we see an image that shows the twigs of one cell. We could say those are the blue twigs that are right at the front of the field in association with many others, many other cells. So all of the cells have these twigs that are extending out in all directions. The arrangement is so complex that each individual brain cell is in contact with and communicates with roughly 10,000 others. And we can animate this and move through this fabric of brain fibers and just see how complex and dense it is. And it's actually far more complex and dense than what we're seeing because the real situation is one of this field being completely packed with nerve fibers with no empty space between them. The empty space is shown artificially in order to allow us to get at least some picture of the arrangement of all of these fibers. It's useful to take a brief look at how this picture is built up scientifically. What we see in this image is an electron micrograph. So it's a very high magnification view of brain tissue. And we can highlight one of those threads, which is seen in cross section and colored in orange here. Now the tissue is in a block because after all, brains are three dimensional. And so the electron micrographs can be produced as the block is sliced. So we can move one slice out of the way and then outline the same nerve fiber in the next. And then we can follow it through the block by outlining, recording the location, and moving on. So with a computer, we record each of those outlines and then build up a three-dimensional view. And we can do this with more than one fiber. So a second one is starting to be colored in here, and we can continue the process. And so we start to build up this three-dimensional representation of how the cells, or rather how the fibers of the individual cells, move through three-dimensional brain space and how they interact, how they connect. It's useful to get a sense of scale here because it isn't obvious how small this really is. So we can compare it to salt. So here's a salt shaker, and we know that inside of it, it's got salt grains, and we can enlarge the individual grains of salt, and we can isolate one and enlarge it further. And so now we're looking at a single grain of salt, which we ordinarily think of as being very, very small. And we can take this brain tissue that we've been looking at, this little block that we were examining with all of our technology, and show its actual size relative to a grain of salt. And you can see that it's indeed very small, so that tens of thousands of these things would fit in the volume of a single grain of salt. So now when we scale things up again and look at this 
animation, as we move through this fabric of nerve fibers, we can get a sense of how small the scale is. We can remember that the field is completely filled with nerve fibers, totally packed, and that they're all electrically active and communicating with each other. And somehow, we're in the middle of all this, somehow, we come out feeling like a person in a world. With all this complexity, maybe it's not surprising that we sometimes have questions about what in the world are we doing? What is going on here? How do I work this very difficult situation out, this very challenging situation of being a complex organism with a lot of self-awareness, carrying around all this biology and trying to survive and thrive? So each of us carries this sense of me within, and somehow it's related to all this activity in the brain and indeed throughout the whole body. And we can look at that activity from either the inside or the outside, as I've been trying to describe. Somehow, whether we're looking from inside and feeling our thoughts and sensations and emotions and so on, or whether we're looking from the outside with electron micrographs or MR scanners or what have you, somehow both of these have an intimate connection with the electrical activity in brain cells, both individual cells such as we see here and billions of them in conversation with one another. When we keep that in mind, then we begin to wonder if there's as much difference between the inside and outside views as there seemed to be in the first place, because both of them seem to provide a picture of vibrating, flowing, electric, aliveness. True, one is more directly felt, but the other, I think, is visible in this relatively straightforward science that we've examined. And somehow the quality of being a person in the world and the quality of having a center to our experience in a field of awareness or consciousness, somehow that centrality relates to all this activity in the body, the brain, in our direct experience of sensations, thoughts, and feelings. And as we conclude this talk, we can take this information that we've developed and use it in meditation. We can know that we have this very complex brain tissue. And we can also feel the sparkling, flowing quality in our bodies. And it all has that feeling of vibrating, flowing aliveness. We feel sensitively into it.